Dear friends, Israel is in a major crisis currently. Um, Israel was attacked on the morning of the 7th of October, uh, just two days after the Feast of Tabernacles by a horrendous onslaught that came over from the Gaza border where uh, Hamas terrorists uh, penetrated the uh, defensive fence across the Gaza border, entered into all the 24 communities that are stationed across the borderline and uh, massacred in many of those places civilians, women, children. They took hostages, many of them old people, including Holocaust survivors that were taken over to Gaza with children, young women, men, raped them, um, even tortured them over in Gaza. We don't know how many are alive at this time. It was one of the darkest stories, uh, moments in the history of Israel. President Herzog said this was the darkest day since the Holy Holocaust for the Jewish people. What we are witnessing here in Israel is nothing else than a militant manifestation of the spirit of Amalek. Uh, the spirit of Amalek that is uh, having its roots in the Bible is an ancient spirit that attacked Israel again and again at crucial times of their history. And therefore we believe that this battle that Israel is going right now through, it is not a battle that is just fought by flesh and blood, by the intelligence and by the grandeur of the Israeli army and their, their uh, new technology weapons that are in their hold, but it will be won, I believe, even to the largest degree by a massive prayer support from around the world. Um, the first time that the uh, spirit of Amalek appears in the, Be in the Bible as uh, where they manifest themselves as a nation even can be found in Exodus chapter 17. And please uh, let me read it, the passage to you. Exodus chapter 17 verse 8. We read 17 verse 8. Uh, also a note for everybody who's listening, please take a note pen uh, at your side. There will be quite a number of passages I will be giving you. Please write them down. I promise they will help you in your prayer for Israel at these critical times. Uh, Exodus 17 verse 8, Then Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. So Moses said to Joshua, Choose for us men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. And so Joshua did as Moses told him and fought with Amalek while Moses, Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And whenever Moses lifted up his hand, Israel prevailed. And whenever he lowered his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands grew very, so he took a stone and put it under him. They took a stone and put it under him. And he sat on it while Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side, the other one on the other side. So his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this as a memorial in a book and recite it in the ears of Joshua that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it, The Lord is my banner, saying, A hand upon the throne of the Lord. And the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Father, I ask you that you use this word right now as a testimony to people around the world, enabling them and equipping them, Father, how to enter alongside Israel in this critical battle at this time and season which we find ourselves. In the powerful name of Yeshua, I pray. Amen. So Israel was in the desert um, in Rephidim. It was the last position uh, before Israel arrived at Mount Sinai. And uh, the Bible tells us that it was uh, actually Amalek that was attacking uh, the people of Israel. It is the book of Deuteronomy which informs us 
how this attack against Israel was taking place. In Deuteronomy chapter 25, Deuteronomy chapter 25, we read about uh, uh, this very attack and uh, where Moses, this is his last sermon that he gave to Israel, reminds the people of Israel 40 years after this attack, remember what Amalek did to you on the way as you came out of Egypt how he attacked you in the midst of the way, when you were faint and weary, and he cut off your tail, or some translated, he cut off your rear guards, and those who were lagging behind you, he did not fear God. So that means this initial attack of Amalek, it wasn't an open battle like Joshua later on did, but it was a... Um, a hideous attack that came from the back that was attacking not just the military people but mainly it says here he was attacking the faint, the weary, uh, those people who were lagging behind. And here we see the very first parallel to our uh, situation today when uh, those terrorists ended on the 7th of October. Uh, their main target were civilians and not just any civilians, children, women, Holocaust survivors, elderly people, they were brutally murdered. I was just there on the location, saw it with my own eyes a few those days ago. And those who survived, they took as uh, hostages over to Gaza Strip, where today an estimated around 200 people are kept hostages. Again, mostly uh, women, children and elderly, the faint, the very, uh, those who cannot defend itself. And as this attack took place, Moses' tale told Joshua, you need to confront that challenge. And he says, we have a twofold strategy. Number one, you go down on the battlefield. You are addressing Amalek with your military forces. This is what's happening right now as I speak at the borders of the Gaza Strip, where Israel is messing up its forces in order to deal with this threat of Hamas in the Gaza Strip. At the same time, we feel the Holy Spirit is calling us, that he's calling the church today to be up on the mountain like Moses, to be up on the mountain with Aaron and Hur, to have a prevailing, persistent prayer for Israel, that as they fight this battle, that they will have a clear victory and that there will be a new situation for Israel, for the people of Gaza, and that it will be a turnaround moment for the people of Israel. But it will be one in battle. It's quite interesting that it says here that as long as Moses held up his hand to heaven, Israel prevailed. And that's why we, fa we feel we will, day, as from day one of the battle, the ICJ committed, we stand with Israel every single day in prayer until the war is won. And please take uh, clear notice, I'm not saying until the battle is won, we need to win the war until, uh, against this wicked spirit of Amalek. And uh, therefore, we have installed several prayer meetings that we invite you in prayer initiatives that will last and as long as the war is uh, going on. And uh, also what I want to take notice here, that as uh, um, Moses was praying on this mountain for the people of Israel to be victorious, uh, he realized that something happened in the supernatural area. Something happened in the, in the, in the uh, heavenly places that as he prayed, there was a banner erected. On this banner said, the, the Lord is our banner. He is the one who fights our battle. He is the one, it's not by power or by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And we are called today as a church to stand with Israel in prayer in this critical moment. He also says, as he declared, the Lord is my banner, a banner of victory. He said also, the hand upon the throne of the Lord. In Hebrew, Yad al Kise Adonai. That means Moses felt as he was standing on that mountain, interceding for Israel in battle. Uh, it wasn't just a regular prayer, but he was putting, so to speak, his hand on the throne of God. The Lord gave 
gave him an extra amount of executive forceful prayer that it that he was stretching the lord was stretching his hand his scepter out of the heavenlies in order to give israel uh, this uh, decisive victory so this is the first occurrence in the bible exodus chapter 17 as israel came to refidim and how israel was winning the battle a battle that was won in prayer the question is who is Amalek? Who is behind that force that suddenly, in such a vicious way, attacked the people of Israel? Now, the roots of the spirit of Amalek, or of this false Amalek, go all the way back to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 36, verse 8 said, 8 said that his firstborn son, the firstborn son of Esau, was a gentleman called Eliphaz. And his child was uh, Amalek. That means that Amalek was the grandchild of Esau. And the rabbis are telling us that Amalek was inheriting the hatred of Esau that he had against his brother Jacob. Amalek was inheriting the hatred that Esau had against his brother Jacob. It was a hatred that emerged out of a conflict that were taking place when they still were relative young, when Jacob got hold of that blessing of his father Isaac and Esau was left out. When he got the firstborn right, he purchased it from Esau because he didn't honor and didn't recognize it. And as he was receiving that blessing, the blessing that Esau felt he should be receiving, meaning a blessing of the land, a blessing to be the people of God, there was a jealousy spirit in him that is lasting until today and that is unfolding here in the Middle East. In Genesis chapter 32, it is for the first time that this jealousy spirit is manifesting itself. And this is the story we all know where Jacob returned from Haran back into the promised land. He was in the field of a, the river Jacob. He was going, planning to go over the river in, in order to enter the promised land, to return back to the land of his fathers. And the Bible tells us in Genesis uh, chapter 32, verse 6, that the messengers came back to uh, Jacob and he says, Your brother Esau is in the way, on the way to meet you, and, he is and with him are 400 armed soldiers. In Genesis chapter 32, verse 6, we read, Messengers returned to Jacob, saying, we came to your brother to your brother Esau and he is coming to meet you and there are 400 men with him and Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed and it's quite interesting the way how the fear of Jacob expressed itself in that situation he wasn't just afraid of his own life but in Genesis chapter 32 verse 11 we read it was a very particular fear he says please pray to the Lord deliver me from the hand of my brother from the hand of Esau because I fear him that he may come attack me and the mothers with the children that means jacob in a way knew his brother that when he comes with 400 soldiers the people who would be really endangered would be the women and the children in his camp and he said lord please deliver me we read how jacob was praying the whole night uh, the Bible reports that he was actually fighting with God. He was wrestling with God uh, that night. And the Bible says he prevailed. He had a breakthrough. And God gave him a new name. Israel shall your name be, God told him. And as he went over, this is the most positive outcome of any of the stories where this brotherly hatred is being revealed. We see that the hatred of, of Esau melted away from his heart. The brothers reconciled and they lived together for quite a number of years in the land of promise. And my prayer is that my, the Lord give grace that a similar situation might unfold with the Arab population here in this land, that this hatred will melt away as it did in the, in the time of Esau. 
Now the second passage that we read about this uh, spirit of, of Amalek, the grandson, grandson of Esau, uh, we saw it was chapter 17 in the book of Exodus as they attacked Israel at the Rephidim. And the very next passage after that you find in 1 Samuel chapter 15. 1 Samuel, Samuel chapter 15 verse 1, you read the following passage, And Samuel said to Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint you to as king over his people Israel. And he said, Therefore listen to the words of the Lord. And you need to understand that the occasion that was taking place, Samuel came to Saul, and Saul, Samuel understood from the beginning there is something in Saul. I'm not sure if he will make it. But then Samuel said, this is a decisive moment in your own royal dynasty, a possible dynasty over Israel. He says, if you get this thing right, if you do this thing in the right way, I will establish your kingdom in Israel and you will be the chosen vessel for me to rule over Israel. And the task he needed to fulfill in order to secure this anointing over his life, he says, thus says the Lord of hosts, 1 Samuel 15 verse 2, 1 Samuel 15 verse 2, thus says the Lord of hosts, I have noted what Amalek did to Israel in opposing them on the way when they came out of Egypt. Now go and strike Amalek and devote it to destruction. And that means Saul's task was to deal with Amalek and his generation. And the sad thing about the story is, is that he won the battle, but he lost the war. He won the battle, but he lost the war. He won the battle in terms that he really had a military victory on that particular day against Amalek. But the Bible also tragically reports us in 1 Samuel chapter 9, But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and the oxen and the fattened calves and the lambs and all that was good, and they would not utterly destroy them. Now Agag was the king of Amalek and God's, the Bible tells us that Saul spared the king of Amalek in that battle and he survived. Samuel at the end was very frustrated and said, Saul, you just missed your opportunity. If you really would have done the, what the Lord told you to do, if you really would have finished in your generation this militant, terrorizing spirit, um, you would have established your kingdom. But now, as he said, the Lord has found a man after his own heart. And his name, of course, we all know is a King David. Now, the very next passage where we read about Amalek now, it has to do with that very king, with King David. In 1 Samuel chapter 30, it says, Now, when, the, when David and his men came to Siklag, on the third day the Amaleks had made a raid against Negev and against Siklag. They had overcome Siklag and burned it with fire and had taken captive the woman and all who were in it. Does this remind you on something? This is exactly what we saw on the television screen the other day. The women and the children are taken captive over to Gaza. And it's quite remarkable. It says he came to Siklak, to the Negev. That's exactly the area where those attacks were taking place, not just a few days ago. As a matter of fact, in a way, the Lord immersed the Christian embassy fully into this war that um, two days before the 7th of October, on October 5th, the ICJ on the last days of the Feast of Tabernacles, we were down in that very, in that very area. We took a solidarity mission of 700 people down to the Gaza envelope to stand in solidarity with the people who are living there under constant rocket fire. People told us, he said, we felt the presence of the Lord in a powerful way. Uh, this was exactly there at Siklag. And, uh, and as David was returning back to his, uh, to his camp, he found it was looted, it was destroyed. 
and that uh, the women and the children have been taken hostage. Now, what did David do? It was a critical time for him. The people were frustrated. We see this today even in Israel, a great frustration over the leaders of Israel who feel uh, the, the people feel that they have let them down. And David was greatly distressed, he says, in chapter 30, verse 6, first book of Samuel, 30, verse 6. David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him because all the people were bitter in soul. And let me tell you, this is the situation right now here in Israel. The nation is bitter in soul. How could something like that happen in our country? How can this happen in a nation that claims to be the start-up nation, that has such an incredible army? How could we allow that to happen? And they wanted to kill and stone David. And it says here, but David strengthened himself in the law. That means David went on his knees. He was seeking the Lord and the Lord spoke to him and he says, you shall pursue them. He was asking, should I attack them? And he says, yes, pursue them. And the end of the story is that all the hostages were released. And honestly, this is my prayer even today for all those hostages who are, as I speak, down in Gaza, that through a miracle, the Lord will release those hostages uh, back to Israel. And this was this, the, the, the third time or fourth time that this um, spirit of Amalek um, appeared in the Bible. Two chapters later, David became king over Israel. It is embedded in this very last battle report where King Saul died. And just two chapters further, uh, David became king over Israel. And the very last passage that I would like to bring to you uh, that the Bible speaks about in a very powerful, maybe the most powerful way about this spirit of Amalek we find in the book of Esther. In the book of Esther, chapter 3, it says, after these things, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman, the Agagite, the son of Hamadeda, and advanced him and set his throne above all the officials. I'm not sure if some of you took notice when we were reading 1 Samuel 15. The king that Saul spared and who, was, who survived the battle against Amalek, his name was Agag. Now the Bible tells us here in Esther chapter 3 that Haman, this arch enemy of the Jewish people, was a Agagite, meaning he was a direct descendant of the royal family of the house of Amalek. And listen to what he was planning in verse 8, chapter 3, Esther chapter 3, verse 8. Haman said to King Ahasuerus, there is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from those of every other people. They do not keep the king's law, so that they, it is not for the king's profit to tolerate them. Please, if it pleases the king, verse 9, let it be decreed that they be destroyed. You know what reminds me on this passage? It's not just what was taking place in Gaza, but what was taking place just less than 80 years ago in the country I'm coming from, Germany, when exactly this language was implied to kill the Jewish people that were living in Europe at that time. The Wannsee Conference in 1942 spoke exactly about that. They are dispersed of all across Europe. Let us kill all 11 million Jews. Let's destroy them. And don't make a mistake, this force of Hamas that is manifesting itself in the Gaza Strip right now, they do not plan just to uh, make life difficult for the Jewish people. If you listen to their sermons on Friday in their mosques, if you listen to the key leaders of Hamas, they have a very declared target, and that is to annihilate the Jewish people from the Middle East. Their target is not just the Gaza envelope. It is in their statutes that they will not stop fighting until the last centimeter of Eretz Israel will be freed from the Jewish people. And this is exactly the very same spirit that manifested itself through Haman in the time of Esther. Now, what did Esther do? 
It's a long uh, story, but let me come to the very conclusion of that. Esther is challenged by her uncle Mardochai to take a stand. She is uh, the first lady of the kingdom of Persia, you can say the wife of the king. He didn't know that she was Jewish. Mordechai said, please go in, stand up for your people. He said something very significant. If you don't do it, somebody else will stand up. But you and your house, you will perish. At the end, Esther stood up, put herself together, and she said the following. Now go and gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my young women will also fast as you do, and then I will go in to the king uh, through it is against the Lord, and if I perish, I will perish. Now we know that this Esther fast brought the breakthrough for the people of Israel, but it's also important for us to note that the story does not end with the Esther fast, but like with Amalek in uh, Exodus 17, like David when he sent out his troops, like King Saul who had to mobilize his army, the Bible says also the very next story, chapter 8 in the book of Esther, she went to the king, he says, please allow our people to defend itself. Let, it read, let me read it to you. Uh, she approached the king, then he sent letters. This is Esther chapter 8, verse 10. Uh, Esther chapter 8, verse 10. Um, he sent letters by mounted carriers throughout his empire, saying that the king allowed the Jew who were in every city to gather and to defend their lives and to destroy, to kill and to annihilate any armed force of the, any people and province that might attack them, children, women included, and to plunder uh, their, go their goods. And quite amazing in chapter 9, the next day, Esther comes again to the king. He said, do you have a wish? He says, let us do it for another day. Let us make sure that this anti-Semitic spirit, this Jew-hating spirit, will not raise its head anymore in the land where we are living. Now, this is a rough summary now of all the passages that I have uh, that I want to give here you today, uh, where the spirit of Amalek manifests to you. And let me just uh, uh, conclude by highlighting three commonalities in all of those stories that are relevant also for the conflict right now. Number one, the spirit of Amalek always manifested itself by a spirit of terrorism. It was never a spirit that confronted Israel in open battle. It was attacking the weak. We read that while David was away uh, fighting another battle, he was, they were attacking his camp, kidnapping, host, taking hostages, children and women. We read Haman wanted to wipe out the entire population, young, old, children, women, everybody needed to die. And this is exactly the spirit that we see here today. It's a manifestation of the very same ancient spiritual force. And I honestly believe that Israel can ultimately only be victorious if the church of Jesus Christ around the world is standing with Israel in this critical time. Like Moses, they raise up their hands to pray for Israel. Like Esther, declare fasts all around the world to stand with Israel in this critical hour. Uh, secondly, it comes at points, the spirit of Man Amalek uh, manifests its point, uh, itself at points that are critical in Israel's history. I say it again, the spirit of Amalek manifests itself in points of history that are critical to the, Israel, to the future and history of Israel. And we see this uh, for the very first time when Esau was attacking his brother. Jacob made a strategic decision. He heard the voice of the Lord to go back to his homeland. So to speak, you would say to make Aliyah to the land of Israel. Settle your people to the land of promise. And as he made that strategic decision to enter into his destiny, that's where Esau was attacking with the 400 people, targeting the women and the children. 
It's quite interesting, Exodus chapter 17. The Bible says Israel was at the Rephidim when Amalek attacked the people of Israel. Again, the weak and the poor and those who couldn't defend itself. Rephidim was the very last station before Israel arrived at Mount Sinai. We all know Mount Sinai was the mountain of destiny for Israel. That's where God came down from heaven, made a covenant with Israel, gave them his law and his word and his commandment. It's the place where the rabbis say that's the moment when Israel became a nation. They, like Jacob, was entering into his destiny, coming to Israel. Israel finally entered into their destiny to become a light to the nation, receiving the word of God. And just the last station before that, Amalek attacked in order to frustrate God's purposes with the people of Israel. If you go to the story of King Saul, it was a decisive story for him. Saul said, I'm going to confirm your kingdom. It's an important point in your life. If you get this right, you will be the king over Israel and anointed like King David later on would be. But he got it wrong. What a tragic story that is. And of course, King David, we all know that he was just about to become king over Israel. And again, Satan rose through the spirit of Amalek, wanted to attack the people of Israel, taking captives, women and children. And finally, in the time of Esther, we know that as Esther was uh, with the Jewish people in Persia, now there were already some people in the land of Israel that returned before the story of Esther was uh, to the land of Israel. But while she was the uh, um, first lady of the kingdom of Persia, the Bible tells that people like Nehemiah, people like Ezra, they were teenagers, young people in the kingdom of Persia. That means if all the people would have been annihilated, there might have been a remnant back in Israel, but those prophetic figures that, figures that determine the future of Israel, like maybe no one else in their generation, they would have wiped out, be wiped out from history. And just going back into our recent history, just think 80 years ago, Israel already had a Zionist movement started by Theodor Herzl. The target was clear to return back to the land of destiny, to enter in what, into what God had for them, to bring all the Jewish people back to their homeland. And it was exactly at that moment when Adolf Hitler arose, a manifestation, impersonation of the spirit of Amalek, planning to annihilate all Jewish people. Now let me be very clear what I believe here today is that the reason why we see those horrendous attack, what prime, the, pre, the President uh, uh, Bushy Herzog said, it's the darkest hour in the history of Israel. I honestly believe Satan knew that Israel is about to enter into a significant period in their destiny. We are today in the 75th anniversary of the State of Israel. It's quite remarkable to see that Abraham was 75 years old when he entered into his destiny into the promised land. And could it be that we are just ahead of those glorious days where the Bible says, Behold, I'm going to pour out my spirit of grace and supplication. They will look upon him whom they have pierced and mourn for him like for their only begotten child. Could it be that we will see the fulfillment of what is written in Ezekiel chapter 36 where it says, I'm going to sprinkle clean water upon my people. I will pour out my spirit. I take the heart of stone out. I will give them a heart of flesh. Could it be that we are in the time where God is uh, like in Ezekiel 37, not only physically restoring, but is breathing with his spirit over the people to bring forth an army that is spiritually alive to be a testimony and a light for all the nations? Could it be that we are living in a time where God wants to save his people, not just physically, but also spiritually? And I want to call upon the church today. This is a strategic battle where we are in. Please, we need every foot soldier. We need every battalion that knows how to pray, that knows how to fast, to stand with Israel at this critical juncture of their history. And finally, this battle in all locations, be it with David, be it with Esther, be it with Moses, be it with Esau, 
It all was one in prayer. Esau was wrestling, uh, Jacob was wrestling the whole night with God. Moses, Aaron and Hur were up on the mountain, intercessory prayer continuously. We read about Saul, about King David, how he was seeking the Lord. And we read about Esther, how she called out a fast. Therefore, the Christian embassy today is calling on the global body of Christ to stand with us in prayer in this critical moment. Please join us in prayer. On the 7th of October, the day when this war started, I declare to the global family of the ICJ, we are going to pray every single day until the war is won. And I want to invite you to join us. We have daily global prayer gatherings where you get information from the area here, how we can strategically pray for Israel every day, four o'clock Israel time. Secondly, there is just as a few days ago, we started a 24-7 prayer chain according to the Hebrew month Rosh Chodesh. And we are inviting you to join either of these groups or generate your own group. Please be in contact with us. Send us an email at below email address prayer at icha.org. And finally, we are calling on the global body to join us in Esther Fests. I say uh, intentionally Esther Fests, plural. The ICJ, we are right now on the last day of this Esther fast. Uh, tonight we will break it, but I know that tomorrow a new battalion of uh, intercessors will join us and they will start fasting for a decisive victory in Israel. And we want, you to, invi we want to invite you to join us in this critical moment, to join hands in Israel. Uh, please go to our website that you find down in this area where you can join and how you can register and recruit yourself to be in this Esther Fest with us on behalf of the Jewish people. And also we would like to give you very practical prayer points in this time and this season. The areas that we want to pray for is number one, we pray that the war will be successfully and completely uh, won by removing this terror organization Hamas from uh, this area. Uh, this is an organization that is not a political group. It is an organization that is not there for the well-being of all the people. It is a vicious terrorist group that just showed its face in the last few days. And we need to pray that this force will be annihilated from uh, this area. Secondly, we pray for the protection of Israeli soldiers. Right now, as I speak to you, some 500 plus believing soldiers are in the serving in the IDF, coming from Messianic congregation. They need your prayer for supernatural protection in this time of need. Please pray for, in particular, for the Messianic believing soldiers, but pray for every single soldier in the army. It's the people of God that brought God, God that God brought back here to the land of Israel. Thirdly, pray for unity in the people of Israel. We are right now in one of the most decisive moments in Israel where Israel is divided in several camps. Please pray with us that Israel as a nation will be united. Thirdly, very important, pray, pray that this conflict will become a spiritual hub for Israel, a spiritual source of well-being. Like Jacob was, uh, had, the, had his encounter with God as he was challenged by those 400 soldiers of Esau, let's pray that this will be the moment where God's spirit will be poured out over his spirit. Like the prophet Zechariah said, they will look upon him whom uh, they have pierced. Also, please pray for protection of all those who love peace and freedom in the neighborhood of Israel. Pray for those Palestinians in Gaza that want to live in peace and in harmony with the Jewish people side by side, that in a supernatural way they might be protected. Pray that God will call forth Rahab's. You know, Joshua chapter 2 speaks about this woman from Jericho that God called out uh, in order to stand with the people of Israel. And this woman 
became a hub of blessing for her own people. She even made it in the lineage of King David. And let's pray for an army of Rahabs to emerge in Gaza that will clearly stand with Israel. And even like Rahab did, give uh, the, uh, the Israeli army the intelligence where the hostages are and how to win uh, the battle. And finally, pray also for the Arab churches in the Middle East. Pray that God would give them a prophetic voice, that they have the courage to stand up and denounce this brutal, bloodthirsty spirit of Hamas. And they take a clear stand with the people of Israel. Pray for their protection. Pray for courage. Pray for a spirit of revelation upon them. And also, finally, please pray for the ministries here in the land, for the Christian embassy, for ourselves. And let's trust the Lord that he will use this time for a glory. Please allow me for his glory. Please allow me to pray with us. Father, in the name of Yeshua, I do ask you that the world, Father, that I shared will be a world that will bring forth much fruit around the world. Father, I call forth in the name of Yeshua a army of intercessors, a army who is willing to fast, an army that is willing to go up on the hilltop to pray for Israel in this time of battle. That they're, they're, even as they're, they're, their arms might get very like with Moses, that you raise up errands and whores who are lifting up their hands to heaven in order to prevail. Father, we ask for the people of Israel in this time of crisis. Father, we ask you to see miracles that after this war is over, that your name will be glorified, that your name will be manifested, not just here in the land of Israel, but around the world. We pray this in the powerful and beautiful and mighty name of Yeshua. God bless you here from Jerusalem, and I hope we will hear from you.